In the Pacific, around the islands of Micronesia, lie shipwrecks that are witness to a war between humans. Their guns are long since quiet, but once a year, the animals now living in and around them bombard the sea with their eggs and sperm. On the bridges of battleships haunted by corals, the funnels no longer emit smoke, but eggs. Crown of thorn starfish, sea urchins and giant clams, lodged like so many squatters on the wrecks, explode around the time of the spring full moon and release billions of sexual cells which will reproduce when they happen to meet. On the sides of the shell-studded battleships, the fertilized eggs grow, become larvae and mingle with the mass of plankton. There the predators await and swallow them in vast quantities. The largest of these has managed to move its 10-ton bulk here for this annual rendezvous, which promises to provide it with an orgy of plankton. This 18-meter giant, the whale shark, has come with its escort. Jacks take advantage of the hydrodynamic effect it creates to travel more quickly and without effort. They adhere to its lips in the hope of gleaning a few scraps of food. Remoras stick to the whale shark's tail with their suckers. They too are waiting for a few leftovers. The whale shark is joined by other giants. Their perception of the electromagnetic field and their age-old instinct has enabled them to make this annual journey at the same time every year. They suck up the plankton at the surface rather like skimming the cream off milk. They greedily swallow 2,000 tons of water and plankton per hour. The water is ejected through their gills, which are fitted with filters to trap the food. Despite their 300 rows of minute teeth, they never masticate. Their horizontal swimming enables them to feed continuously while clearing their filters of the excess of plankton. shark does not feed only on eggs and larvae. It also sucks up anything that's small and has fins. Dozens of anchovy, too busy to get out of the way, are gobbled up in a single movement of the lips. When the school of anchovy takes flight, the shark heaves itself back round towards it, the anchovy then seek to protect themselves by twirling around its body. Then the whale shark straightens up vertically and in this uncomfortable position herds the anchovy towards the surface, trapping them there so it can snap them up more easily. You are never alone in the ocean. Inquisitive sea lions come to see this great beast which is feeding on anchovy in their own hunting ground. It has left them without anchovy and is calmly gliding away. 
the sea lions have noticed more interesting prey, a school of steel pompanos, also attracted by the plankton. Faced with the predator, the steel pompanos regroup into battalions and close their squad's ranks. Like an army of immortals, lost in the mass, they seem invulnerable. The sea lion has a problem, focusing on a single pompano. In response to their zigzagging maneuvers, it counters by dividing up their battalion. Finally, it notices the fish that is having trouble keeping up with the rest. It isolates it and will not let go. The sea lion, which has no hands to seize its prey or suitable teeth to tear it to pieces, breaks it up by hitting it against the surface of the water. is a mammal and likes to play for the sake of playing, often to the detriment of its prey. The turtle is a difficult prey since it has so many scales and a razor-sharp beak, so the sea lions tease it half-heartedly for a bit of fun. The reptile gets off lightly for the time being. But fish also abuse the slippery surface of its shell to remove their parasites. The turtle basically lives on what the reefs offer it, coral. While it cleans the coral, the fish clean its shell. The turtle has found its favorite meal, the sea cucumber, a mollusk. The animal tightens into a ball to avoid being bitten and is swept along by the current towards the rocks where it tries to hide. The turtle can migrate thousands of kilometers to feed or to find a mate. Coupling occurs on the surface. It's a procedure that takes time and the turtles need to breathe. In the tossing waves, the male clings on with its rear flippers, while the female wears itself out trying to recover its breath. The female will cross an entire ocean to lay her eggs. She will face a thousand predators and will often have to break using her four flippers in order to avoid them but she will always end her life in the mouths of scavenging sharks. At one of the summits of this food pyramid, one solitary predator reigns supreme, the tiger shark, king of the warm waters. Always on the lookout for food, this six meter long predator glides along in coastal waters near oceanic islands. If it fails to find any live prey, this thin dustbin contents itself with picking clean the dead bodies lying among the reefs. The tiger shark, a veritable hyena of the seas, is a great eater, but none too fussy about what it eats. It does not discriminate and happily bites into everything. Large and small fish, manta ray, turtle, marine birds, sea lion, but also tin cans, boots, and even compromising papers belonging to one of Napoleon's spies. 
anything that arouses its sensory receptors will provoke an attack. The November full moon shines over the Galapagos Islands. Darwin's Island is the gateway to the infinite expanse of the Pacific, 10,000 kilometers of blue, of marine currents, storms, and deadly traps. Every year, during the full moon of November and December, numerous species of fish come together and initiate their love ritual, which ends in sexual debauchery. Male jacks, attracted by the smell of the pheromones released by the females, set about pursuing them, all against one. The males give up their pursuit as soon as the female has laid her eggs, and they have had the chance to fertilize them. Billions of oocytes turn the sea cloudy and attract another giant predator, the manta ray. This cousin of the shark, supported on wings spanning six meters, swims through kilometers of schools of pelagic fish busy reproducing. Large mouth open, the manta guzzles down the eggs, rushing the groups of fish which close ranks. Side by side, the rays comb the sea, swallowing thousands of lives. On both sides of its mouth, the manta unrolls the cephalic lobes, which it uses as a spoon to gulp down the plankton. suckers to the manta's back and belly, the remoras feed on food scraps and parasites. And on the remora's back, other parasitic fish bustle about and clean them in turn. Alongside the food pyramid, there is a cleaning pyramid. In the undersea world, no creature has hands to clean or scratch itself. So prey and predator spend a lot of time rendering such services to each other. It's meal over. The manta ray has just come to rest over a reef, always the same one, and offers its gaping mouth to the scavenging ras, which thoroughly ridded of its parasites. Here are the sea lions again inspecting the manta ray's large unfurled wings with a view to turning them into a playground. This ballet between mammal and shark has a different meaning for each. Only the sea lion is sufficiently developed to have a sense of play. It's having fun while the manta is putting up with its antics. The sea lion discovers a new game, surfing. In the vast blue expanse, nothing is wasted. The manta ray's excrement makes the remoras happy. In the 
sea, everything is recyclable and recycled. The manta ray scraps are patiently absorbed by the mollusk. The mollusks suck up the food, grind it with their small teeth, detaching the particles and bringing them back to their oral cavity. All living organisms shut away among the coral, capture, catch, trap and feed on minute particles. When life abounds in diversity, there is considerable interaction between animals and intensity of predation. Over the millennia, the animals invent new strategies for survival or capture. Camouflage is the most sophisticated form, where the creature attempts to blend in with the surroundings on account of its appearance, movements, or color. A crab carries an entire sea urchin in order to hide and to put off its predators. Other monsters lie in wait in the sand and only keep one eye above the surface. The king of camouflage is undoubtedly the octopus. It can change color at any time by simple contraction and relaxation of its pigmented cells, the chromatophores. It confuses its enemy and allows it to swoop down on its prey. Its meter-long tentacles crush the large crab in a few minutes, and then its sharp beak tears it apart. also has enemies, and they know when to surprise it. Today, this female octopus is building her nest to lay her eggs. As she has no bones, she can adopt any form and can slither into the smallest of holes. There she protects herself from predators by blocking up the hole with stones. Here she lays between 100,000 and 400,000 eggs, and hangs them for two months in cocoons no larger than grains of rice. She carefully ventilates them by fanning a current of water around them until they hatch. While she's taking care of her future offspring, she stops feeding for two months and will therefore die as soon as they are born. But after 30 days, the water has suddenly got colder. This will delay the hatching of the eggs. The female is weakening fast. Will she live long enough to look after her eggs until they hatch? Driven by necessity, she makes the mistake of leaving her den to look for food. Her neighbors, the moray eels, which usually distrust her, sense that the balance of power has changed. does not succeed in dissuading its predators. The moray eels do pirouettes, rather like crocodiles do, to tear off meat.
the final struggles of a mother who wanted another month of life to ensure the survival of her babies. dies in one last cloud of ink. Her death means the death of all her eggs, which will dry out for lack of care. It's the time of the truce, a time when the prey cleans the teeth of the predator who badly needs it. All forms of life happily participate in this symbiotic relationship. No nook or cranny is spared, even the most risky. Some fish are more cautious and don't entrust their flanks to others. They rid themselves of their parasites using a stone until it becomes too smooth. Or they use the coarse skin of the coral shark for their grooming. The coral shark has a problem. It is not quick and agile enough to catch a healthy fish. It therefore depends on the preparatory work of other fish. These hound an octopus and wound it. The meal is ready, and the coral shark only has to help itself. A relationship of service is also established between the coral shark and the jack. The jack sets about hunting. It attacks and wounds an ailing creole fish. The creole fish shelters in a cavity. The whole population of the reef comes rushing in for the kill. But the sharks drive all the other creatures away and fight over the prey. It's every shark for itself. It's a matter of seeing who will be most adept at working its way into the rock crevice. And then it's siesta time, some lying on top of others like lions, but mine is the affection. Leopard rays hunt under the very eyes of their predators, but they have nothing to fear from the hammerhead sharks as long as they're not diseased or wounded. They scan the floor with their nose, which is designed to detect crabs, shells and mollusks. They dig to unearth them and take in sand at the same time. Despite their powerful jaws, they sometimes have difficulty grinding shells that are too thick. And soon the schools of leopard rays will cover the sea, like so many stars carpeting the sky. It's time for the killer whale to try its luck. This mammal reigns supreme at another summit of the food pyramid. It's the nightmare of the rays, because unlike the sharks, which only hunt at night, it's active day and night and needs to feed more often than sharks. It harasses the rays until they become exhausted and zeroes in on the weakest.
In the deep, night quickly takes hold. Among the debris of naval battles, another battle is played out. Oocytes, plankton and worms in all shapes and forms bustle about, grow and transform. Schools of young sardines begin to come together, gradually forming enormous shoals. An army of cuttlefish moves into line and maneuvers to surprise them. fish has two tentacles and eight arms. It launches its two tentacles like harpoons and stores its prey using the suckers covering its arms. Sharks are also present. At night, the sea belongs to them. They're on the prowl to satisfy their appetite. All their prey know it, and they all lie low. don't bother to hide, for they are toxic and their stings are poisonous. The sharks spread fear, track down hiding places and hound those fish that panic. This fish has hidden itself well, but it's disturbed by a lobster. Its movements attract the attention of the pack. The red fish ends up being caught. A parrotfish looks for a refuge. Will a mere crevice be enough to protect it from the relentless sharks? fish captured by the most skillful causes of frenzy. The sharks lose all their inhibitions and turn on each other. It's along the coasts of Chile and South Africa that the food chain appears in all its splendor. Cold currents trapped between the coasts and the continental shelf travel northwards where they mix with the warm waters. This cold current is rich in plankton and attracts schools of pelagic fish, such as sardines, which use it as their stable diet. Enormous shoals of sardines are formed, covering several hundred kilometers, and are driven by the cold current surging up the coasts toward the warm waters where they will breed. they haven't got there yet. Their journey will turn into a genuine obstacle course. All the sea's predators will be converging on them, starting with the schools of jacks, whose equivalent on dry land are packs of wild dogs. Jacks are very ambitious when they're hungry. Their upper jaw contains an extra row of formidable canine teeth. They depend on their visual acuity, and so can only hunt during the day. The jacks start by forming a wall on one side, then a second wall on the other side. They channel the long ribbon of sardines, pushing the shoal to make it more compact. Then they divide it into sections. The sardines close ranks 
squeezing up against each other. Finally, the Jacks isolate a group, pursue it, and drive it towards the surface. Then they proceed to attack. The first of the many feeding frenzies that the sardines will suffer is beginning. suddenly awash with millions of scales and pieces of flesh. These attract manta rays, which devour the particles. Then, when the jack's frenzy has died down, larger, though no less voracious, fish take over. The wounded or dead sardines fall through the water at a breathtaking speed, but will not have time to reach the ocean bed. Finally, black-tipped sharks, as always, gather up the remains of the work of others. When the sardines have all been devoured, the jacks regroup. They feel heavier, they digest, and it's their turn to be vulnerable as they close ranks again. They have sensed the threat of their predator, the bottlenose dolphin. guided by sound. It sends sound signals which hit the fish and bounce back to its lower jaw in the form of images. Once it has seen a jack that is weaker than the others, it doesn't let it go. The jacks have no other defense but to scatter. The dolphin can simultaneously snatch and swallow several fish per minute in a single movement. After six minutes, the bottlenose dolphin has to return to the surface to breathe. The enormous school of sardines continues its progress northwards. All the sardines are the same size and the same age. The ones at the front are better fed and can get oxygen more effectively. But they tire quickly, and they're in the front line, and so more likely to be eaten by predators. And these predators, common dolphins, have come from far away, attracted by the high-frequency sounds emitted by the school of sardines. Dolphins have a very keen sense of hearing when they're hungry. Some 10,000 of them cross the dark and cold waters to pounce on a billion sardines. The females, with their young pressed against their belly, supervised by groups of male guardians. The oldest trail at the rear.
they all have a voracious appetite. They communicate their enthusiasm and fine-tune their hunting strategy. The well-organized dolphins dive under the shoal of sardines and push it up towards the surface. All they have to do now is open their mouths and help themselves. Sardines, for their part, have a common defense strategy, pirouette and complicated figures to disconcert the attackers and ensure that they always have another sardine at their side. Sharks have a keen sense of smell when they're hungry. Unlike dolphins, sharks don't live in a cohesive social structure. It's every shark for itself. A fourth species of predator has noticed the shoal. Colonies of gannets cover 200 kilometers a day to go and fish. The gannet has very keen eyesight when it's hungry. From above, it sees the school of sardines that has been pushed up near the surface by the dolphins, and which is now increasingly compact. The gannet floats like a boy, so it has to dive at 100 kilometers an hour in order to pierce the surface of the water. At the last moment, it folds back its wings to avoid smashing them, thus creating a hydrodynamic form. dive in successive waves up to 30 meters deep. Sometimes the shoal manages to place itself beyond the reach of the bird's beaks and the gannets tire. Predators arrive from all over, common dolphins guided by their sense of hearing gannets by their eyesight, and sharks by their sense of smell. An informal alliance of predators formed for a feeding frenzy. And soon the greatest predator will make its presence felt, the bride whale. The party is over for today, and the common dolphins return to their polar waters. They express their contentment, sharing their excitement, and regaling their young with lengthy tales of the hunting adventure. For the young are there too. They have not taken part in the hunt, but they have observed it, hidden beneath the belly of the adult females. The females took it in turns to dissuade the sharks from coming near until they had all eaten their fill. The school of sardines, despite its losses, continues northwards and approaches the coast. It passes alongside a cliff where a sixth predator perches. The frigate bird, with its two-meter wingspan. The king of the gliders is also king of the cowards. Unlike the gannet, the frigate bird does not secrete enough oil to protect its wings. So if its wings become wet, it sinks. It has therefore adapted its hunting method to its handicap it is one of nature's bag snatchers. Under the water, the sharks jam an isolated school of sardines up against the surface to finish it off. The 
frigate birds have to sneak between the shark's teeth and the spattering of blood without getting too wet in order to capture their prey. One of the frigate birds captures a sardine, all the others hurl themselves onto it to get their share. Finally, what remains of the school of sardines arrives in the warm waters of the north to breed there. For many of the older sardines that have already made the journey often, this will be the last one, because the food chain is dominated by one supreme, invisible predator, Homo sapiens. The overly warm waters, the stress created by the predators, and asphyxia due to the sardines' compact formation have caused collateral damage. Carried along by the current, they will not go far because refuse collectors are following their tracks. Cleaners of the seas work furiously at emptying every reef and every crevice. They are so excited and overworked that they become clumsy. Everything is cleaned. Thanks to the sharks, the sea will always be clean. This one-month frenzy comes to an end when the ferocious predator turns into a docile patient, imploring a ras to clean its teeth. body is so tense above the reef that it forgets to swim and risks sinking. The southernmost tip of Africa, at the Cape of Good Hope, where the warm waters of the Indian Ocean meet the cold waters of the Atlantic, is where we find the largest of the predators, the great white shark. It lords it over a large area containing a dozen colonies of sea lions, its favorite prey. The sea lions frolic about in the kelp, which they take the opportunity to gulp down in order to fill up with vitamins. In a radius of a few meters around the island, they feel safe thanks to the shallow water. Among the panic-stricken sardines, they're enjoying themselves, playing with the cormorants. Great white sharks are patrolling, waiting for a sea lion to get carried away with the game and make a mistake. Some 20 great whites are laying siege to these 2,000 sea lions on the little island.
The island is a fortress surrounded by a circle of death. The six meter long great whites glide close by the island, but don't dare penetrate the kelp which surrounds it out of fear of getting stuck there among the rocks on account of their size. This predator and its prey have swum face to face for thousands of years. But in order to go and look for food in the sea, the sea lions have to take the risk of crossing the circle of death. The sea lion is knocked about, but as happens every so often, it manages to escape thanks to its agility. Back to the school of sardines. Surviving fragments are returning to cold water. Bronze sharks, natural predators of the sea lions, join them but don't pay them any attention. But the sea lions make sure they keep behind the sharks, even nibbling at their tails by way of teasing. Now they have to cross the circle of death again to get back to their island. It's evening, the time when birds migrate and the great white shark is at its most active. For their part, the sea lions are tired after their long journey and are less vigilant. blood red, and the great white sharks, the summit of the food pyramid, have killed the weakest, the most absent-minded, and the most hesitant. of thousands of years, each animal in its own way has brought about a natural selection amongst its prey. It has enabled its species to reproduce only its best elements in order to survive, evolve, adapt, and become stronger. In the sea, as on land, failure to adapt leads to extinction. <laughs> 